questions that's been raised uh, about the faction is that what we're trying to do under cover of talking about these DC cases is to smuggle in a load of other issues that shouldn't really be considered under this kind of heading. And I think that uh, as Marxists we have to see that something like this doesn't happen by accident. <coughs> it isn't a kind of product of contingency. It just happens to pop out of something. It's a result of a process of something that's been going on in the party for quite a long time. It's a symptom of something that's been going on in the party. Uh, in some ways expresses some of the difficulties that, that, that we've had as an organisation. So we've lost, according to the CC's own figures, 450 people since March. If you go back to the beginning of the crisis, or the manifestation of the crisis, 2008, with a respect crisis, then it's something probably near 600 people. Some of these have joined other groupings, or set up groupings up, some have just vanished into the kind of ether. We cannot sustain this kind of loss any longer. And our 300, 400 people, and I think the party has reached the tipping point that I still mentioned. So we have to understand why this has happened. And to do that, we have to go back um, really to the, I think, the, the starting point of the, of the crisis, which is the, the crisis over respect in 2008, 2007, 2008. A number of things emerged during that crisis, and this branch was one of the leading branches in trying to resolve it and, and, and to actually fight John Rees and Lindsay German and Chris Bambury and Chris Nynham. Um, but it became apparent that there had been divisions within the Central Committee for several years, which nobody knew about and nobody was told about, which then erupted into an open faction fight between the, the Rees German group and the rest of the CC, into which the party was then invited to take, take a side. So that's one thing. We have a method of electing a leadership which is supposed to produce a coherent a leadership which, which manages to you know, act uh, without splits and divisions. Divisions have been going on for years. We didn't know about it. Over the next two or three years, same thing happens again. Bambury leaves, this time taking 60 people with him. Then Dan Swain leaves. Then it turns out there's another split within the CC involving Mark Bergfeld and Hannah Dee and Raymond Morrell uh, and Joseph Chinar at that point. All the people, of course, who are absolutely essential to the Central Committee, and then two weeks after the split happens, they're no essential any longer. And somebody else is absolutely essential to put into the CC who does agree with the CC majority. So for five years, we've had, what, three, maybe four splits, two of them leading to actual setting up of different organisations. And none of this known to us until the split actually happens. And then all of a sudden it turns out there's been these deep divisions going on for months and years in some cases, which we're not allowed to know about. The children must never know who's shouting at each other in Vauxhall uh, until it actually becomes something that you can't hide any longer. Now, this is not a good way to run a party. And it strikes me as a problem, if it's A, that the secrecy and the fact that we're not allowed to know what the divisions are, but also why are there divisions? What are these divisions about? And I think it's partly, or mainly, because the party has lost its way to a very large extent. And we are actually suffering from a crisis of membership. I actually did some work on the figures using last year's figures, which suggest that we have 7,597 members in 2012. Now, I can see people chortling in the room, but let's go through it as to why exactly this is a load of nonsense. And I'll use three kind of measures here, uh, different measures, which is slightly different results, but they're within the same kind of general range. Um, in the lead up to January, um, no, actually, the March, something like 540 people signed the, um, the opposition faction statement. Another 500 signed a statement that was drawn up by the Central Committee. So that's just over 1,000 people. The CC then said in party notes that over 1,000 people had participated in the aggregates leading up to conference. So from two measures, both the people who signed up for the factions of the CC or the people who turned up for the aggregate, in the face of the greatest crisis the party has ever known, slightly over 1,000 people were prepared to either come to a meeting or to sign up to one side or another in what was the emerging dispute. Now, OK, there won't be an exact alignment. Some people have gone to the aggregates who didn't, say, who didn't sign up for faction and so on. But we're talking about somewhere between 1,000 and 500 people. That's, you know, that's the number of people prepared to actually commit themselves to doing anything at this point. Well, let's take another measure. In this case, uh, locally, let's take Edinburgh. Last year, we had 170 claimed membership. I counted the number of people, the number of different people who came to any event uh, that I was at uh, between January and March, including the aggregates, the branch meetings, conferences, whatever. Um, and something like between 35 and 40 members of this branch were at that. In other words, less than 25% of the claimed membership. Now, OK, maybe there's one or two other people doing things in trade unions that we don't know about and so on. But let's say 40 people, right? If you then take that as a percentage of... Oh, and this is, this is a big branch. This is an active branch compared to some of the branches where those meetings are in single figures and where it's difficult for people to even hold old 
street sales and so on. Which, this, is, this is one of the strongest branches in the country. And so we have that, that percentage, that would give us an actual national figure of something like 1,850 people. Right. One final measure, and that's the measure of um, people paying subs, of which um, there are 32% of the, the total figure I gave you, which would produce something like 2,532 members. Okay. There are people who don't pay subs, who can't pay subs because they're too poor, don't have bank accounts and so on, but are active, that's fine. Unfortunately, there are also people who pay subs who don't do anything other than pay subs, so that kind of cancels yourself out. So if any, this is any, any kind of you know, estimate. Where we have an organisation a year ago which has at the lower end some 1,500 people in it, at the top end 2,500 people in it, based on any measure of, of act activity at all. Not 7,500 and so on. Maybe it's a bit up, maybe it's a bit down, but it's something of that order and we've lost about 500 people in the intervening period. So this is the reality. Right? The party is actually smaller now than it was when I joined it on a permanent basis in 1984, and this branch when it came up. It's smaller. Back in 1984, we had two branches in the city. We had something, I don't know, 90 or whatever, 100 people. But they were real people. I mean, they were actually people who came to the branches. And if you didn't turn up for a branch, you were phoned. Sometimes you were even visited to find out why you hadn't turned up. And that was what most people did. Now there's an enormous load of people which is, you know, who are names on a list. Our, our definition of membership is your name is a learned membership list, basically. Now, there are probably some people in the room who, who agree that we should have a more rigorous definition of membership. It is not that I think we need some kind of ridiculous attempt to go back to 1902 uh, and professional revolutionaries and so on. That would be absurd and would reduce our membership to about 50 people uh, if that was seriously done. But we have to have something that takes account of what people who are aged, their, their, their care requirements, their, their money, their, where they live and so on. That gives a realistic sense of what our membership actually is. Actually, we have shrunk. And although we, we punch above our weight in the classic expression in certain areas, such as anti-fascist work in certain kinds of united front. And that's in fact we are smaller than we were when we started off. So something's not working, you know? <laughs> you keep saying we'll be tremendously successful and so on. So actually, we're not. We're smaller. Now, how the hell does that happen if we're, if we're pursuing a successful strategy? The third thing is, I think, and the reason for this, is a misunderstanding of the period and how it actually functions. Now, I've written at length about this in the ISJ, and there's a dispute about it which we will have at the branch, I think, a week on Wednesday uh, in the meeting on neoliberalism. But what I want to say about that and how we have mis misjudged the period, in a sense, is that it leads to certain um, bad practices. One is that because we are much smaller than we pretend, there's always so many things that we can actually do. So when we assess what we have to do strategically, tactically, and so on, we don't actually judge it on the basis of what needs to be done. We judge it on the basis of what we can do what we're capable of doing. So strategies that we're not going to be capable of doing will simply not be considered. But rather than admitting that and just saying, we're too small, we have to work through some other way of doing this, like, for example, private sector uh, trade union recruitment campaign or whatever it was I was suggesting a couple of months ago, we don't do that. We just pretend that it's not worth doing because essentially we can't do it. Now, that's, that, once you introduce that kind of lying into your strategic thinking, once you begin to base strategies not on, on actually what the, the real assessment of the situation is, but what the fact you think you can get away with, that is that you begin to, to, to have a, a totally flawed position and one which isn't going to give you effective results. What I think it leads us to, on the one hand, is a stra uh, an attitude towards the trade union bureaucracy, which the phrase is usually working with and against, but these are supposed to be in a dialectical unity, not on the one hand working with them when they think we can get them to do something and then denouncing them when they don't do it in a sort of serial kind of way. That isn't an effective strategy at all, and that happens all too often. But much worse than that, is, and this takes us to the point about Martin, actually, is that we come to rely on individual people, on the leaders who can do things, who are friendly with the bureaucracy, or who are, are simply very effective comrades. And Martin was a very effective comrade. But because we come to rely on them in the absence of the actual mass basis of membership that would allow us to do certain things. And that is why I think the, the, the enormous defence of Martin went on. Not because I think there's a rape culture in the SWP. I think that's a ridiculous accusation that certain comments have made. I don't think that's the problem. The problem is a reliance on individual people to do carry out things and to get us into certain positions. And if they come under threat, then all hell and hell must be moved to defend them to actually make sure that they're not touched and they can actually carry on, which I think is what happened. And then certain behaviours follow, certain questions follow about people to kind of th 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 throw dust in the, in the eyes and, and prevent an actual assessment being made. Of course, the point should be that no matter what Martin Smith's talents, which are very great indeed, that has nothing whatsoever to do with his behaviour towards, towards comrades and questions of sexual harassment and so on. So this is the, the difficulty. This is where we are, I think, and where it's led us to this position. Now, the only way we can get out of this now, and there are kind of short-term and longer-term things, I think that the short-term, the apology is necessary, not just to the woman. It's necessary to show 
that the rest of the left and the world that we have taken this seriously and are doing something about it. It's, it's kind of, you know, we, it does matter to us what people think of us. You know, the people, the Marxism, half the size of last year. Unite the resistance, half the size of last year. You know, that's our major public facing event and our major united front. And its conference was actually half the size of the one. So what's happening here? People are, some people are beginning to, to walk away from us or being not prepared to walk this. So it's important that we actually make some kind of statement to recognize what has happened um, in, in this case. But more than that, and I think this is the, the, what the, the faction is arguing for, the people responsible for this have to be accountable for it. And that I mean the people who did everything they could to defend Mark, who lied about the cases, who said there was no second case, and then prevented it, tried their best to stop it happening. The people who have acted factionally without actually declaring a faction. I mean, back in January, there was a meeting uh, of a group of people who handed out a list of people on the National Committee that you should vote for. And you know, that's a factional activity, right? Whether you call yourself a faction or not. And this is why we talk about an undeclared faction that exists and behaves and meets and organises and, and, and puts out lists of names and so on, but never ever declares itself, never puts itself forward with a name or stands or declares where it stands in, in, in the IB or anything like that. But we have. I mean, we have actually been quite open about ourselves, certainly not been secret uh, about what we've, we've been doing, but that's not true, alas, of everybody in the party. This has to now come out. People have to be absolutely clear about where they're standing and what they're really wanting and who they are. Now, as far as I'm concerned, the people who've been responsible for leading us in this disaster can no longer lead it, can no longer lead the party. There's no question of just going, well, let's just carry on. Let's all be, you know, let's just imagine we can, we can forget about this and then go on with it. We're always being told about accountability. There's never been any in the situation. The CC have conceded several things over the last year, grudgingly, with ill will, with bad temper. There was never going to be a conference, then there was a conference. There wasn't going to be a, a committee to look into the speech committee, then there was. They were going to suspend four comrades, then they didn't. And now they've put a sort of half apology out in terms of the motion that's come out. Everything's been dragged out of them. And consequently, they have gained no benefit from it, and neither has the party, because it seemed to be grudging and ill-willed and kind of only done as a last resort to stop anything worse happening. This is not, the way, this is not leadership. And it's not the way to actually uh, resolve the difficulties and problems that the party has. We kind of work with a sort of endless conditional future tense. You know, when are we going to have the assessment of the strategy or the, the or, or response to the Well, let's just carry on and at some point we'll see if it actually happens. No, no, we keep on saying, well, let's just wait and see if this is going to... No, it never plans out. It never actually changes. Nothing happens. We don't grow in membership. We don't develop. So there's something wrong. If we're not growing, if we're not developing, we're not planting our influence deeper in the class, there is something wrong with the strategy and therefore something wrong with the leadership. And that has to therefore be changed. This is not something that can be allowed to carry on or we will end up in a situation where we become like the Socialist Party or any other of these parties which, are, which manage to keep themselves going and, and enough to, to kind of recruit a few members and so on and, and manage to, to survive, but are not actually in a position to, to fight for the leadership of the working class. That means the whole question of democracy, how decisions are reached, is extremely important. Because the only way you can arrive at proper strategic thinking is actually if you have a proper democratic discussion, not just a bunch of 14 or 15 people listening to their pals who tell them what they want to hear, and then, and then, they'll, then they'll carry on the way they've done before. Conference has to become an actual conference where decisions are made. At the moment, it isn't. There are no decisions really made at conference. I can only think of one in the last year, and that was the one about Jerry Hicks and Len McCluskey. Fine, that was an actual decision which he made to support. Other than that, Go on, the students, we had a student strategy agreed at January conference. It was then changed within, what, a month, three weeks of the conference happening. Unite the resistance. Was that established at conference? No, it was established at the National Committee meeting. And I well, didn't actually explain what it was going to be about, and it took another year to actually find out what this is all about. We don't make decisions at conference. What we actually do is actually pass fairly vacuous perspectives things, which say things like, you know, we have... Um, had a good strategy against fascism, but we can't be complacent, or the economic crisis is going to carry on, or there's, there's some opportunities, but also problems. And you know, this kind of stuff, which doesn't commit us to anything, but just actually allows the CC to do what it likes once conferences close down. This can't, I think, go on, because it's one of the reasons why I think we're not making any real, any real progress. Uh, and just simply inflating the successes that we can have isn't actually getting us to the point where we can do that. So, what is the, the faction arguing for? We see this, first of all, it is about the DC cases. It's not, and I'll talk about something else, we're starting from this point. That's what's brought most people into the faction, was the actual uh, revulsion at what happened, at the way it was conducted, and that needs to be now done. But at the same time, it does actually link into much deeper issues, which some of us have been arguing about for some time, as another example of the kind of thing that happens without a kind of reform of the party structure. Something that will happen again. 
at the time of respect. Um, some of us predicted there would be other catastrophes like that if we did not actually change the way we operated at the time. These have now come out. They've happened. They will continue to happen unless we change the internal structure and workings of the party, which means it's deeper democratisation. That isn't going to happen in a day or a week or a month. It's a longer term process, but we have to actually start the process with this conference, with some of the, 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 the motions and the arguments that are put in around. And that's why we, we urge people to join the faction or to continue that work. Okay, thanks very much.